test one. Uh, thank you for coming. It's uh, pretty late in the conference, and it's a pretty good turnout for this topic. Uh, my name is Keith Basil. I am a product manager with Red Hat. I cover um, our new installer for OpenStack, which is called OSP Director. I also cover Sahara as a component within OpenStack, and I also cover Ironic um, as a component in OpenStack. Uh, so we've seen internal to Red Hat a lot of um, demand for uh, Hadoop on bare metal within the context of frame, um, OpenStack. So uh, we put together a very esteemed panel of experts in various fields, and we are going to discuss uh, various uh, aspects of um, Hadoop on bare metal within OpenStack. So with that, we'll get started. Um, the agenda is as follows. We're going to do maybe a one slide introduction to Sahara and Ironic to level set where we are so that we're all on the same page. And we're going to talk about briefly the holy grail of elasticity, basically using one, one framework for both use cases. And then we're going to talk about who is doing the heavy lifting upstream and then immediately go into the panel. So the first part would be about five or six minutes. And then I want to spend the most of the talk uh, in terms of implementation so you guys can uh, get some good feedback and ask a lot of questions. So with that, uh, we'll get started. So what are we talking about here? Conceptually, it looks something like this. So we've got the Sahara elephant, which is the, I mean, the logo, which is the, uh, sorry, the elephant is the logo for Hadoop, uh, standing on top of OpenStack, standing on top of bare metal. Uh, so this is the, the thing that we're doing here. So. Um, so why do we need this? Uh, the answer is data, data, data. So we all know that we're generating a very large amount of data, uh, you know, social media, financial transactions, instrumentation, IoT is becoming a thing now, and we've got to capture and manage all the data related to that. And then those use cases are spread across multiple industries, so finance, healthcare, telecom, energy, retail, et cetera. Uh, we've got um, actual customer on the panel as well that can speak to probably two or three of those, those areas. So that's the driver. All right, so Sahara and Ironic, just a level set here. So Sahara is a component within OpenStack. It provides a framework, uh, basically an API-driven framework to deploy various distributions of um, OpenStack, uh, various distributions of uh, Hadoop. So if you look at the, uh, the kind of middle tier there, you'll see Hadoop. That's the upstream Apache-based Hadoop, kind of generic vanilla Hadoop. So Sahara can deploy that today. So think of it as one-click install for a Hadoop cluster on virtual machines. That's already baked. We already have that today in OpenStack, thanks to uh, some of the guys here on the panel. Um, we've got commercial plugin support. So if you needed a distribution of Hadoop to, uh, that needed support, you can uh, use the HTP, which is the Hortonworks um, distribution, Cloudera, and we're working with MapR upstream as well. And essentially, the way Sahara works is you pick one of these plugins you want to deploy, and it creates basically a heat stack and uh, deploys all of the uh, services using you know, Nova Heat, Cinder, and Glance to extend that cluster up for you. So again, today we do that on virtual machines, which is on the left. But tomorrow, or in the future, or some very early uh, work is being done via Ironic and Bare Metal on the right-hand side. So this is kind of what we're talking about here today with this, with this topic. Um, this was a thing I saw in the Cl Cloudera Hadoop training. Um, for those who have a Unix background, once I saw this command line, I totally got what Hadoop was all about, right? So basically, you have a data source. You're streaming that into something. You're doing search patterns on it. You sort it, and then you unique it, and you bring out a data set that meaning some means something to you. So I just I threw that in so that you could get a one-line understanding of Hadoop, OK? Um, so on Ironic, uh, very similar um, framework where um, Ironic has an API, it has things called conductors which manage uh, bare metal, and it puts these, um, the data of all the nodes into a database. And then it's a pluggable interface, so uh, you can have ironic drivers for each one of those vendors up there. So Quanta, Open Compute, Cisco, Dell, HP, et cetera. Those are the drivers that speak and control, uh, basically provide command and control for the bare metal. So we're talking about Sahara, big data, and we're gonna use the framework of OpenStack to deploy on bare metal. So at a very high level, this is the holy grail of elasticity because if you look at OpenStack as the um, best you know, open source platform for inf um, infrastructure as a service, it's built upon elasticity, right? So we've got OpenStack on the left, we've got the compute nodes, um, we've got OpenStack as a framework, a set of known and common APIs, and then now we are going to look at racks of gear uh, where we can actually deploy Hadoop onto bare metal. So 
we got one set of APIs to drive both use cases. And in terms of network optimization, these guys love east to west traffic. So typically, um, you know, a scaled out OpenStack cloud will be deployed with a spine and leaf topology, you know, optimized for east west traffic. So Hadoop has the same requirement. Um, and both expect failure. So if one hardware node goes down, you're okay if you have an application that's been built as a cattle. Um, Hadoop has that natively built in with HDFS and redundancy and replication and things like that. So they're very, very similar, almost cousins, if you will, in terms of their underlying requirements. So with that, um, we'll talk about who's involved. So on the Sahara side, you've got Marantis leading the charge. You've got the PTO of uh, Sahara on, on the panel with us today. Uh, Red Hat is a contributor as well. On Ironic, uh, you've got HP, Red Hat, and Rackspace. Rackspace has done a tremendous amount of maturation work to bring it up to speed. And we've got uh, Jim uh, from Rackspace to talk about implementation and all the nuances and details related to what Rackspace has done there. So we're very privileged and lucky to have these two guys on the panel today. Um, so let's talk about the panelists. So we've got uh, Henrik. Henrik, you can raise your hand. Uh, he's a senior product manager from uh, HP, uh, focusing on Nova and Ironic. We've got Sergey, as I said, the PTL uh, of uh, Sahara today. Ethan Gafford is an engineer at Red Hat working on Sahara. Blake Caldwell, um, he's actually an end user uh, doing Ironic today on, in OpenStack in his facility. And Jim is the, uh, the Rackspace guy I mentioned. And Dave Eason is uh, from Cloudera, so he, he's directly from the Hadoop uh, community. So with that, we'll get started. So. Um, We've broken up the questions into one quickly on the market side, and then we're going to get into implementation. And then we're going to have an open mic session. So if you guys want to have questions, feel free to walk to the mic and uh, uh, bring your questions to the table. So in terms of market drivers, um, Dave, um, as a member of the Hadoop community, where do you see the demand uh, coming from in terms of growth for, for big data? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Um, basically, uh, the demand is right across um, you know all all industries and you know for us as a company it, it's incredibly strong it, it's no secret that Cloudera we've been growing you know 100% uh, year over year both in terms of number of customers and revenues and that's been the same for each of our competitors in the space for Hortonworks for Mapr um, and for the ecosystem as well it's been been growing incredibly strongly. Um, Going back, you know, 18 months, that was all predominantly uh, bare metal deployments um, because that's what Hadoop in, in its early stages was designed for. But in the last 18 months, that has transitioned to be, you know, a, a very significant proportion of both public and, and private cloud deployments. Are you seeing uh, OpenStack um, drivers there as well, or is it just purely the big data side? In the, um, in the, in the private cloud uh, deployment, um, OpenStack is, is the clear leader in that from our, from our customer's perspective the base that we support. Um, so that's definitely um, driving it, but just the, the biggest thing there um, we see is just the uh, customer data volumes, you know, totally outstripping even our potential to really satisfy the market at the moment. Wow. So, yeah. so Blake, um, thanks for joining us. Um, I took a look at, look at the Oak Ridge uh, National Labs uh, website and it seems like you guys cover a lot of area, areas. One is clean energy, um, national security, obviously, and, and some of the uh, other nuclear-related sciences. Um, I understand you guys are using OpenStack and Ironic. Uh, can you talk to us about those particular use cases in an unclassified way, I guess? Yeah. So there's one main reason that typically drives um, customers, in a sense, um, other divisions at our lab um, to use our common <laughs> OpenStack infrastructure. And a lot of times it's that they have an immediate need. They have a, a project deadline and they have a budget. So they want to have hardware deployed and they want to be able to use that quickly um, instead of a conventional deployment, um, you know, hardware deployment life cycle. So they end up coming to us, what can we do with, with OpenStack? And uh, two projects that come to mind. One are, is IFIM, um, Institute for Functional Imaging of Materials. And it, it's another, it's a data-driven need where the imaging is advancing at such a rate that now it's not just, specific to this project, it's not just the position identification of atoms within a material, but also dynamic elements. Um, so uh, angles of the bonds, um, molecular dynamic um, pieces of that. So there's a multi-dimensional multi expansion in the amount of data that is generated by these imaging um, systems. 
and then they have a requirement to, anal to analyze it. So um, the request was a Hadoop cluster. How can we you know, make use of the infrastructure to you know, stand up in a Hadoop cluster to run analysis on this uh, information? Okay, great. Uh, so I want to switch to implementation details, uh, which is probably the reason most of you guys came here today. Um, so Hadoop can be deployed on VMs today um, using Sahara, obviously. At what point do we need to consider going to hardware? And maybe that's you know, a question for Sergey or Dave um, in terms of where that trade-off happens. Okay, so uh, on the Sahara side, we're uh, going to use uh, and already use uh, the heat for the provisioning and uh, ironic integration with NOAA as a hypervisor driver uh, makes any, any, any NOAA user ability to, to spin up the bare metal machines. It means that for Sahara, we only need to prepare specific images for bare metal and uh, probably uh, add some additional testing for it. So it means that right now it's, it's, it's possible to deploy the uh, bare metal Hadoop clusters using the OpenStack uh, with Ironic, and uh, uh, it's, it's done like it transparently uh, under the Novos and uh, Ironic implementations. Yeah, and just to add, at least from our perspective, um, the, the question quite often comes, it's virtualization versus bare metal, where we, as a vendor that supports different use cases, have a slightly different perspective. We actually see three tiers of use cases, those with, um, real-time interactive SLAs, uh, applications like HBase and Search, which actually still require the um, sort of performance that a bare metal deployment uh, would give you. Uh, they're pretty much exclusively on bare metal today. But there is two other tiers, you know, uh, interactive analytic use cases, where there is actually a legitimate place for just virtualization and, and even network attached storage and object stores. There's, there's valid use cases of that, but depending on your SLAs. And then actually uh, where we've seen, you know, the most of the adoption for even virtualization is, uh, you know, in batch data processing, data cleansing, the traditional kind of map reduce workloads, which depending on your SLAs run very well in virtualized um, instances, but it's, it's predominantly in that first use case, the interactive uh, real-time workloads, things like HBase and search from an application perspective, which is going to be driving the need for engines like Ironic and access to bare metal to get the the performance that we need to support those use cases. So, so in terms of deployment, uh, on that note, um, I, I know uh, Cloudera, they pub you publish a reference architecture mm -hmm. for deploying OpenStack. Yep. I mean, not OpenStack, <laughs> sorry, I had OpenStack on the brain. Um, Hadoop, but um, is there anything we need to know? Are there any nuances? I mean, how does that apply inside an OpenStack framework? And ma maybe Ethan, if you sure. can add to that, or Dave, if you want to start out with an answer, it'd be great. Yeah, so I mean, the, the simple thing that's, that's usually referenced um, in our traditional reference architectures, um, it was always about getting access to direct attached storage and just a bunch of disks, you know, configured so you can get that access. Um, in, in the virtualized context, we've had to adapt that slightly. Um, many who follow the Hadoop community would have seen uh, recent things like um, the Hadoop uh, virtualization extensions, which allows a configuration file for um, layered network topologies in addition to uh, the sort of more sophisticated layered uh, VM topologies, uh, which you know exists with with some of our virtualization vendors today. Is and that where the data locality comes from? It's exactly in, in a virtual environment to yep. pass to Hadoop. Yeah, from okay. the framework. I mean, a key part of the HDFS system is um, uh, data replication for purpose of redundancy and performance, and so that configuration allows you to. Um, to deploy in a way where you ensure that you've got isolations where, where your, your data is replicated and also for balancing across uh, the balance of policies are, are impacted by that uh, topology as well. Yep, and on the Sahara upstream side, we've actually taken some steps just in Kilo mm -hmm. to sort of close that gap further. You know, we've got instance locality through Cinder's um, instance locality filter. Uh, we've got default templates that basically are executable reference architectures, and we got that for CDH for HDP. Um, but, you know, that virtualization piece is still kind of the elephant in the room, especially on right heavy workloads <laughs> for s s short SLAs. Yeah. You know, we're not there. Yeah. Okay. Um, Blake, in your environment, since you've already deployed OpenStack, um, is there anything that you guys do differently in terms of architecture? So we're concerned with the, well, our users are very concerned with the, uh, the performance aspect and a perceived overhead um, from a virtualized environment. So, um, I mean, we're all aware that, that that gap can be narrowed, but 
sometimes when you have a customer that's demanding you know, the bare metal, it's very difficult to convince them that a you know, virtualized environment is acceptable. Um, so that's one hurdle we've, we've encountered. Um, and it, you know, beyond that, just um, being able to set up an infrastructure with um, high interconnectivity. So a lot of times they're coming from an HPC background where they want an InfiniBand interconnect or you know, at the very least 10 gig interconnect. So being able to provide that service is um, you know, a concern of ours. Okay. Um, Ethan, I know you're involved with packaging of plugins for yep. our specific uh, uh, OpenStack. I am. Um, do we, is there any reason to package differently if you're going to deploy to bare metal versus VMs? Um, so from the plugin perspective, I mean, not terribly. You know, happily we use Cloudera, you know, the exact same repositories for Cloudera mm -hmm. for Hortonworks um, in a VM as you would use, you know, to a bare metal deployment anyway. Um, you know, the general process of spinning up a cluster is, you know, you build your image, you provision, and then you configure. Those, you know, uh, image building and configuration pieces are going to be very, very transparent across, you know, any uh, provisioning mechanism. Uh, the devil's always in the details, but, you know, if, if you see a failure in our future, Sergey, you know, try so, man, uh, but... <laughs> so in Sahara, we're basing our image building process on an OpenStax project named Disk Image Builder, mm -hmm. and uh, it supports uh, building images for the bare metal deployments for Ironic and uh, for the virtual machines as well, so it's uh, by design supports both of the approaches. Well, okay, excellent. All right, so let's now turn to uh, a really important topic related to bare metal, and that's uh, multi-tenancy and security. Um, so HP hosted a session earlier in the summit uh, related to secure boot on bare metal. Um, do you see that, Henry, uh, Henrik, as supporting us in the uh, multi-tenancy uh, use case? Yeah, I think that's pretty much a requirement, because when, when you do bare metal and you allow users to get full access to, to the machine, you're opening up a whole different world of attack vectors that you don't have when you encapsulate it in, in a hypervisor. So by doing this signed boot st uh, strapping and, and have these signed steps in the boot process, you're making sure that you know, the bias in the firmware hasn't been tampered with by whatever tenant was on that machine before. And I think this is a, an absolute requirement before you go into a multi-tenancy environment. Yeah, and um, Blake, on the other side of the coin, when anybody walks into your facility, they're pretty much cleared, vetted, and trusted. Uh, so you have, your tenants are very different than, let's say, hostile public cloud environments. So what, what's your take on the multi-tenancy and security requirements? I'd say our job is much easier because we have that vetting process that the users um, come into the system, they've already been authenticated, whether, you know, whatever standards and, um, you know, two-factor, however, um, whatever mechanism the you know, security requirement is, um, enforces that the um, the trust level it's not it's not as critical um, you know as tenant we tend to um, you know group the tenants together so um, you know we're not dealing with the case with an unknown hostile sure. um, user coming on the system and, and Jim please jump in I mean because I mean, you guys probably run the most hostile <laughs> customer based yeah. cloud in the world well <laughs> so one thing I wanted to mention is that you never have a fully trusted tenant, right? Um, their laptop that they're SSHing from could be hacked. Uh, they could go rogue, you know, they could be a spy, whatever, right? Um, so I think security is important in any environment. Um, there's a lot of things that are really hard to do, like Henrik said, um, that you need to work with your vendors for, or work with your vendors on to make this secure. Um, firmware signing and that kind of thing. So there, there's been talk about this kind of pseudo bare metal thing where you give a client the machine, but you, ra you containerize the machine either via VM or container proper. Um, is, can you talk to us about the on metal implementation and how you guys do that? Because it seems to me that if you give somebody root on a box, they have access to all the networks. And so how do you compartmentalize that? Right. So there's a couple things we do. Um, we don't use VMs or containers to compartmentalize things at all. Uh, we do all of the firmwares on the box are signed, and we own that signing process. Um, we worked really hard with our vendors to do that. And then there's, beyond that, there's network security. And while we push down two VLANs to every tenant, um, a public net and a, cert in, in a public net and an internal DC service net, uh, we do magic with Cisco and our switches to be able to secure that, um, prevent ARP spoofing and that kind of thing. Okay. 
And when you guys introduced On Metal, you gave a talk afterwards about how to scale out Ironic. Um, so related to big data and having multiple racks, multiple nodes, and a very, very large you know, semi-permanent Hadoop cluster, uh, can you talk to us about scale and what, what problems we may see by, by going that route? So we've mostly solved scaling problems in Ironic. Um, you could potentially boot hundreds of machines at the same time and not have any problems with that process, right? And beyond that, scaling Hadoop on top of bare metal is about network topology, um, your placement of your machines. Mm -hmm. Those are both things we're working on upstream and Ironic. The network stuff is Ironic's number one priority this cycle. And then as far as locality of machines, I believe it works today with some scheduler hints, um, but we do want to look into that more and provide that you know, as a first class thing. Yeah, so based on that topology awareness, that's absolutely critical for Sahara. So the Sahara guys on the panel, do you, any comments on how you intend to solve that? I know later today in the design summit, there's a lot of work about that. And, and as Jim said, you know, up, upstream, next cycle, it, it's something we should tackle. Can you give us some insight into the direction there? Okay, so uh, from, from the beginning of the project in Sahara, we support uh, the configuration file that could uh, uh, describe and define the topology of uh, OpenStack cluster. Uh, currently, it's not dynamic, but it could be improved to be dynamically specified. Uh, and Sahara uses this topology definition to configure Hadoop uh, to know uh, where the uh, data located. It supports for uh, the rack and for level awareness. And so it means that uh, all needed data could be passed to the Hadoop. Okay. So we've got Ironic that has a topology awareness. We need to pass that to Sahara. But one thing that's missing, and Jim, maybe you can help us out here. Um, how has um, the Neutron integration happened? It seems like your magic is based on Cisco UCS. Um, but, uh, so, so that's based on stuff in the Cisco top of racks. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, we use open compute hardware okay. with Excellent. a non-metal. Um, but to speak to Neutron stuff, like I said, that's Ironic's number one priority at this cycle. <laughs> Um, fundamentally, we don't want bare metal to appear differently than VMs from a Nova perspective. Okay. It should be able to mount arbitrary networks in there. It should be able to mount block storage. All the things VMs can do that you know, doesn't require a hypervisor. Okay. So, um, so a lot of us, uh, Rackspace, Red Hat, HP, Mirantis, we all have uh, lifecycle management tools to install OpenStack. Uh, to deploy OpenStack. Um, can you guys speak to uh, what that tool chain looks like in relation to Sahara and Ironic? Um, I know Rackspace, you guys are big on Ironic, obviously. Uh, Red Hat, we're using Ironic for our deployment mechanism in the next version of our installer. Uh, so um, in HP, maybe this is for Henrik. I mean, you guys have been leading Ironic, so um, can you talk to us about the, the, tool cha the tool chain support for Sahara and Ironic? Uh, yeah, so we we, uh, we were a big uh, proponent and, and contributor to to Triple O, uh, and as most of you probably know, we're taking a slightly different uh, approach. And that that Triple O, of course, included Ironic, but now in our, our next release, we're actually uh, taking a slight little detour. Um, so we're we're going more to an Ansible playbook way of of, of doing it. Um, we're still debating and figuring out if if we're going to use Ironic in that release. Uh, or if that's going to be in, in, in a subsequent release, but we're definitely going to incorporate Ironic into our new in, in installer and lifecycle management uh, tool chain as well. Okay. It's just a matter of time if we can actually get it done in, in the first release or it will be in the next one. And Sergey, I, I know it's probably not your area, but with Fuel, are you guys supporting, I know you're supporting Sahara today, right? Yes, yes, Sahara uh, supports it. Are you going to do Ironic so that we can do bare metal to tenant in the next release of Fuel? Uh, so, I as I know, it's uh, evaluating uh, for the next releases to use Ironic for the OpenStack deployment itself, and uh, uh, the same, for, as I know, is evaluating of supporting Ironic uh, as a hypervisor for NOAA in next releases. But I, I don't have much details about it. Okay. Okay. Um, we've kind of already talked about the, what's next upstream. Uh, one last question there, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for open mic. Um, we talked about Ironic's, you know, things for key, um, Liberty, but the Sahara guys, anything in terms of what's next for, for Sahara for Liberty? 
Um, so probably a few highlights for Liberty. Uh, one of the main goals in Liberty is to support the Hadoop HA deployments uh, for both Cloudera and Hortonworks plugins. Uh, this uh, full automatically out of the box uh, configuration. Uh, and it's probably new versions of other plugins and other plugin support. I think it's it's most most uh, interesting highlight. Probably Ethan could. Yeah. Add. Um, you know, we've got HA work certainly within the clusters. We've also got some tightening of our, our HA and reliability uh, in the service layer itself. Um, and, you know, at this point, Sahara's APIs are pretty mature and pretty full featured. Um, a lot of it is um, just tightening user flow, continuing to make that user experience uh, more seamless and easier for users who aren't quite as expert in Hadoop. Okay, excellent. So if we have questions, uh, you guys are welcome to come to the mic and uh, we can, we can Ask, ask these uh, these folks. Hi, Ian Coley with Red Hat. Uh, Henrik, you alluded to something that I've heard kind of scuttlebutt about and concern about uh, HP. Y you kind of tap dance and, and said uh, going in a different direction, but the concern has been that Triple O is being abandoned by HP. Um, is is that going to happen with Ironic too, or you know, basically, what's your commitment to the community and and not just going off in your own proprietary Ansible playbooks? <laughs> Um, so there are a lot of things there, so how, how much time do I have? Um, so we're def for the, uh, first, we're definitely not abandoning Triple O. Uh, we're, for, for our install experience, we're, we're going to use it, like I said, the Ansible playbooks in, it in a different way doing it, but we're not completely abandoning Triple O. We're just you know, lowering our level of, of engagement there because you know, we're refocusing internally. Um, so no, we're not completely abandoning Triple O. Um, <laughs> And being the product manager for Ironic uh, within HP and I have very personal, strong commitment to Ironic. Uh, and like I said, we're going to base our, uh, our next installer technology at some point on Ironic. So Ironic is definitely going to be there in the future as well. And we have a lot of other projects that are involving Ironic as well. So we're as committed to Ironic as we possibly can be. And then when we have, like, so you would, the number one contributor to, to Ironic. So it's, uh, I think Ironic is here to stay both within HP and, and in, in OpenStack, so. Yes. All right, next question. So one of the key things for Hadoop is rack locality and the block placement. How does Ironic handle rack locality affinity? Right, so like I said, we don't have first class support for this today. Um, there are scheduler hints that work. You set some properties on the Ironic node and you can schedule against those via Nova. Um, it's a little hacky. It does work if you know, I guess if you also run Ironic, right? So if Ironic's transparent to you, you can't put that info there. Um, but that's a huge thing for bare metal, right? Is rack locality and failure domains. So we want to give that first class support. It's not a high priority for us, but it will be one day. How can we help? Um, I work for Yahoo, and that's one of the common needs for us. Come join us in OpenStack Ironic IRC, and <laughs> let's talk. Sure. I've got one follow-up question, since we we're kind of talking about installers and using installer to install OpenStack. Uh, in the case of Helion and our product, we have what we call the undercloud, which Ironic deploys the production cloud. So. Uh, the question for the panel is, if you're using Ironic to deploy the over cloud and then you want to expose bare metal to, to a tenant, are you setting up a separate Ironic instance so you have two Ironics? Um, what, what, what are you th thinking there in terms of how you segment the cloud operator infrastructure view from what's exposed to the tenants? Right, so I don't run an Ironic under cloud, um, okay. but I would imagine you'd want that to be separate things, right? Ironic doesn't have any concept today of a tenant or you know, linking a specific piece of hardware to a specific tenant, um, which you would need for that use case, right? And so I think the best thing to do, we run Ironic on VMs, which is a bit ironic. Um, <laughs> but what I would think would be the best thing to do is deploy your under cloud and then run Ironic run another Ironic on top of that yes. to expose to tenants. And Henrik, it seems like you wanted to add, add something. Yeah, so, um, so our non-proprietary Ansible playbooks um, 
we'll, we'll get a bit more flexibility since we're moving away from the over cloud and, and under cloud. You know, it, it will make it easier for, for the customer or the user to kind of configure that the way they see fit rather than being you know, yep. stuck kind of in the under cloud, over cloud architecture. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, sir. Question. Yeah, I, I have a question regarding uh, <clears throat> the HA deployment uh, using the, where were you mentioning about the Kilo uh, features coming with HA deployment on the CDH clusters, I mean on the Azure clusters. My question is that involves several pieces like, you know, Zookeeper, synchronization, journal nodes and things like that. And usually in production, uh, sometime things can absolutely go wrong and you can pretty much lose an HA node and then you have to do replacements and all that. So does the upcoming release takes care of the one-time provisioning of an HA cluster or does it also takes, uh, take care of the, because the, once the HA node is down, the, uh, to bring back another cluster is a very tedious task. So I want to know wh how mature is HA in the Kilo release? Mm -hmm. So we're going to support the HA deployment for Clouder and Hortonworks in Liberty release. Mm -hmm. It's now in design state. Uh, we'll be using the corresponding management tools, like Clouder Manager and Ambari for Hortonworks. Uh, it'll be configured on the installation time, and uh, I think we'll be discussing it on a design summit uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, but uh, in Liberty, we're planning to introduce a health checks uh, framework that will check the uh, healthness of the clusters, including the HA state, and report it to users. Um, so for Liberty, I say that uh, it will be one-time configuration with the uh, ability to manually fix the stuff. And for the next releases, I think it uh, will most probably do something to, to the like a self-healing of the HA, for example. Well, last question. Um, when you talk about distributed Sahara deployment, you have a component of Sahara API and engine. So I was reading the documentations and all it says, okay, we can have a several nodes that can host the API instance of the code. So where does this node fall in? Is it falls in, can it be on a tenant space or can it be, it has to be on the control side or how does, how is it, I mean, where does the API instance, I mean, distributed Sahara, I mean, where does it fall? Can it be on a tenant side or it has to be on the control plane? Um, so the, uh, there is no real, uh, okay. you, could, you could run any number of APIs and engines and uh, there is a round robin balance in between the uh, operations uh, from API to, to the engines. So you uh, probably could just uh, deploy engines on the controller side. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, only the engine, I think, really needs access to control plane resources. And I mean, it depends what kind of um, you know, operator to tenant relationship your cloud has, right? If you have a pure under cloud, over cloud relationship, uh, you know, perfectly okay to run Sahara in the c control plane of the tenant cloud. Um, beyond that, though, you know, I think we do need access to control plane resources, absolutely, yes, in yes, order yes. to provision, you know, resources through Nova. So what I understand is engine pretty much on the control side, but APIs can also be on a tenant side. Um, yeah. Thank Certainly. you. Certainly. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Um, I, I do want to note that later today, uh, Matt Fairley and the guy from Intel are doing a really cool session on Hadoop performance, uh, bare metal versus VMs. So. Uh, you guys should definitely check that out. Any last questions? Go on once. Cool. Well, thank you for your attendance, um, and see you around at the conference.